Claudia Chender, leader of the NDP here in Nova Scotia. Claudia Chender, thanks for joining. Thanks for joining the show as always. Thank you for having me. All right, so uh, reading our story from our website here, Nova Scotia's NDP leader trained her sights on the next provincial election as she announced a program aimed at easing the cost of housing uh, during what was described as a rousing campaign-style speech before the party's annual convention in Halifax. So I guess first off, do you feel as though that you're campaigning already? Well, I mean, we're certainly campaigning in Picto West because we have a by-election right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we do. I mean, the last day of the legislative session, the premier was asked whether he would adhere to the very first bill he entered to much fanfare in the legislature around having fixed election dates. And he wouldn't commit to doing that. Um, and he's shown most recently with uh, this by-election that he is absolutely interested in, you know, maximizing his own advantages with, you know, timing. So certainly we hope that we're going to finally in this province have a fixed election date, but we definitely have to prepare for the case where that might not be uh, so, and we are doing just that. Okay, so let's talk about uh, about uh, housing and what you've got planned and, and th- this new program. What, what what's it all about? Well, we've talked. You and I have talked about housing a lot, mm-hmm. and you know all of the work that we've done uh, around housing in the last several years still, of course, stands. But you know, we just continue to dig into what is for so many people the most pressing cost of living issue that they face which is how are they going to uh, afford rent by keep housing. And so this is what we think Nova Scotians want to know and hear about. And they're not hearing enough about it, frankly, from the government. So what we talked about over the weekend was a few things. Uh, Number one, um, figuring out a way to expedite building that isn't just about tax cuts and zoning changes. Those are important. We need as of right development. We need to expedite development. But another way we can do that is to really support uh, prefabricated and modular housing components uh, in those builds. So when we look, particularly in HRM, organizations like ADSOM, organizations like the Affordable Housing Association of Nova Scotia, they got money from the federal government to do rapid housing builds, affordable housing. They did those with modular building components. They got shovels in the ground and people into those units inside of 18 months. Uh, For the most case, I think they're both net zero, those projects. So people have way lower bills (laughs) and it's meeting our climate commitments. And, you know, we have a real lack of skilled trades. We've talked about that. So there's plenty of work for skilled trades. We need to still continue to uh, make sure we have more uh, trades and that we are training um, and creating pathways for more folks to come. But in the meantime, we think that modular construction is a great way forward. The other pieces are um, expanding the down payment assistance program. So I don't know about you, Todd, but I work with a ton of people in their late 20s and early 30s, uh, people who have, you know, decent jobs and cannot even think about buying a home. Mm -hmm. And so we need to start to talk about what is the path to home ownership for people. We have a down payment assistance program in this province, but we think that it's not generous enough. And again, it's a loan. So that money comes back to government. But where is government investing our money? We want government to invest money in people. And so we think that we could double that down payment assistance program from five to 10% and expand the repayment to look more like a normal mortgage so that people have a fighting chance of getting in their own home. Mm-hmm. And then of course, you and I have talked about rent control and tenant protections. We are still fighting for that more than ever as we uh, brace ourselves for what summer is going to mean in terms of people who are, run evicted or evicted for one reason or another and are unable to pay their rent and trying to find some other option. Um, And we think that a renter's tax credit is another small step that can really help people just to be able to afford their rent right now. What are your thoughts on densification of, of, of HRM? Oh, I mean, I think it's absolutely crucial because the reality is is that HRM is where the services are 
And so where we have services, where we have transit, where we have things that we certainly take for granted here in the city, like sewer and water infrastructure, that's where we should be building. Um, it, it, it makes sense. It, it's less expensive. It has certainly less of an environmental footprint and people can afford to live uh, more affordably and to get around. So I think it's, it's a, it's a, it's a necessary step in addressing the housing crisis. The, uh, the accelerator fund, the federal government's accelerator fund, there's been a, a lot of debate over whether, or whether it's too far reaching. And for that matter, there's been concern over the provinces, what's been described as an overreach, uh, when dealing with some of these things, what are your thoughts on the relationship between the municipality and the other two levels of government? Well, I mean, I think it's complicated. I mm-hmm. think that the province, I think the Houston government did not get off on the right foot when they created these special planning areas shortly after they were elected um, and really usurped a huge amount of HRM's planning authority. Now, uh, I think that the criticism that that planning process needs to move much more quickly is warranted for sure. Um, but the question is how to do that. HRM are the one who have the experts. They have way more planners, certainly, than the province does. So how do we expedite that? I think that we've seen some success um, with the federal government working directly with municipalities to do that. So I mentioned earlier the rapid housing initiative projects. Um, you know, those projects are rent geared to income, affordable, and people have been living in them for, you know, in some cases over a year. Meanwhile, um, so many of the projects we've talked about at the provincial level and at the municipal level for that matter um, are still sort of in their idea phases or are slowly getting built. So I think we need to bring all those levels of government to the table and they all need to figure out how to work together for sure. Um, but I think that the, the heat under um, you know, all levels of government to provide the housing we need is really what needs to be addressed. And one of the things we talked about this weekend is how, you know, the premier likes to say that the answer to the housing crisis is to build more housing. And I think at this point, that's uncontrovertible. We need a lot of housing. Um, But the question is, for whom? And the answer has to be for everyone. And right now, most of the housing we see getting built is simply out of reach for the people who are in core housing need. And that list grows every day. Um, And so I think all levels of government need to work together to make sure that everyone uh, can remain housed, because I think that most of us consider that to be a human right. Okay, and and quickly on the issue of rent control, obviously if people are in that situation where they're renting, they applaud that, but we've got investment property owners, and we know that there's always a counter to all of this, who say that rent control would, would just push more and more of them out and, big, and, and bring bigger players in. What's your response to that? Well, I mean, I think there's a few things. For one thing, I think it's really important to note that rent control is different than a rent cap. Mm -hmm. So right now we have a 5% rent cap, but rents rose somewhere between 12 and 14% last year. So that rent cap is not working. And the reason why is because... um, because it is artificially low or has been compared to CPI, for instance, um, you know, landlords are only using fixed term leases and the rents are going up in, you know, skyrocketing basically between tenants and people can't stay in their homes. Um, So I think that what we agree on, um, what everyone agrees on is that we need a tenancy enforcement branch. So we need to know uh, where the residential tenancy act is being violated on both sides and we need to know that that will actually be addressed. Um, you know, the government is sitting on a report about that, that they refuse to release. Uh, we think it's going to recommend that they go ahead with that. But in the meantime, I think rent control, I honestly think this, Todd, would work well for everyone. Um, will certain landlords be able to charge as much as they want to for a given unit? No. And I, I understand that that's difficult. But... You know, if we had an entire system, then rents would go up, you know, tied to an external metric like CPI. 
So landlords, you know, wouldn't be in a situation where the rents were artificially lower than their costs and they would have the capacity to apply for money to do renovations, apply to put the rent up for various reasons. We'd have a functional tenancy board, which we don't now. So I understand that concern, but I actually think, especially in the environment we're in now, I I don't think it's warranted. And I think at the end of the day, um, if government needs to come down on the side of You know, we hear all the time they need to strike a balance, and that's true. But if we're choosing between people's ability to stay housed and people's ability to make a profit, I think we have to choose people's ability to stay housed. Okay, Claudia, appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Thanks, Todd.